Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Well, we are blessed with an amazing treat on the show today. I have with me Evan Evagora, who plays Elnor on Star Trek Picard. What a privilege. Evan, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Nick. Absolute pleasure. Fantastic. Uh, so, okay, so let's let's go back to, um, to early on before um, you got cast and everything for the role. Uh, tell me, when was the first time you kind of heard they were making a, a new Star Trek series with Patrick Stewart? And how did you kind of come to audition for it? Well, I think the first time I heard about uh, Star Trek and that Patrick was returning, I think it was his Las Vegas um, Star Trek panel. He announced that um, he was bringing the show back. And me just being kind of a fan at the time, I was like, oh, would love to see, you know, Jean-Luc Picard and, um, you know, TNG kind of continue. And then I think my audition process was a bit different to all the other cast members. They kind of found me at the final hour. So... I knew I knew it was um, Patrick Stewart. I knew it was um, Star Trek, but the script I had been given and um, all the names had been changed. So Elnor, I think, was K Bar. That was my character's name, and I think wow, they changed okay. <laughs> they changed Picard to be um, O'Toole. And they gave me three scenes, all kind of you know, uh, all a bit different to show a bit of uh, acting, you know, talent and depth and everything, and then. I was also shooting Fantasy Island at the time, so I was actually in between. I was going back and forth from Fiji at the time filming, and then I auditioned, flew to Fiji, thought I did a terrible audition, by the way. I, I walked out of that room being like, yep, I've not got that. <laughs> yep. The worst job ever. And it's funny because it's always the ones that you don't expect are the ones that you get. And I got a phone call being like, um, you're being considered for the role. And then three days later, I got told it was down to me and three other people, and then I think it was like two days after that, they just said, you've got the role. And I was in F Fiji, I think it was like five or six in the morning. I had just wrapped filming and the sun was coming up and I was getting ready for bed. And my manager called and he said, you know, you've got the role. And I was just like, yep, cool, whatever. Hung up wow. the phone, went to bed, woke up, I think only like four hours later being like, was that a dream? Did that actually happen? I'm not hundred percent sure here. So I kind of had to like ring back and, 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 you know, get it confirmed. And then I rang my mum and she she lost her mind. She couldn't believe it because I couldn't, I couldn't tell anyone, you know, and everyone in my family is so, like, you know, such big Trek fans. And as yeah, soon yeah. as I told them, you know, they just all had questions and they're all asking me all these things and I couldn't tell anyone. So it's been like, I'd say about a good year of having to keep most of the stuff I know um, under complete wraps. And it's been so hard, Nick. It's been, wow, it's I been bet. fun. <laughs> And um, after every episode, you know, I have family members ringing me being like, what's going to happen next week? Like, oh, what does this mean? And like, what's going to happen? And so, yeah, it's been a really fun experience. Wow, fantastic. Mm. Um, so, I don't know, I, I heard you were a Star Trek fan before being cast in the show. Is this correct? I am a Star Trek fan. So, um, TNG is my mm. Trek. I know every um, Trekkie has a different, you know, because there's so many different iterations of it and versions of it. Everyone's got their own you know, Captain, I know Seven of Nines, a lot of people's favourites. Um, after working with Jerry Ryan, she's definitely one of mine. Um, but, yeah, the TOS movies uh, growing up, I think it was Search for Spock is always the first. It's the earliest memory I have of any Star Trek um, thing. Like, what's it, like any movie, any series, is yeah, the Search for Spock is probably, like, up there with my favourite um, treks. So tell me a bit about how... You felt when you first found out you'd gotten the role of Elnor. Did you? Uh, how did you celebrate? I flew back home and had a big party. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, I, I was excited, but it was almost even up until I'd say episode one premiered. You just don't really believe that you've you've got the role. You know what I mean? It's 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 meant so much to me, growing up and had such an influence on me. I still can't believe that I'm a part of it. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I look at the posters of Elnor and I kind of struggled <laughs> struggle to believe it's me. But it's just been nothing but excitement. But like a roller coaster of emotions. You know, like going out um, into Comic Con, into the big hall, and. Uh, showing all the Trekkies the, the first ever trailer for Picard and having yes. a full of like 6,000 people just cheering you on is just surreal. You know, you feel like a bit of a rock star. Do you remember like the first time you saw yourself like on a billboard or something like that? Oh, was, yeah. Was it... <laughs> yeah. Yes. There's a big um, Amazon Prime poster, I think it was in Brazil maybe, in preparation for uh, Brazil Comic Con. And we got sent this massive, massive poster 
um, like this photo in the group chat and I was just like, wow, this is real. This is a big, big thing and I got to be part of Trek, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, mm. that's, that's so amazing. How would you say your you know life has changed since getting the role of Elnor has like do people like stop you on the street do you know have you kind of had uh, things like that happen to you actually no the biggest surprise is a lot of friends gr- I've grown up with I didn't realize how big of um fans they were of the show so that's probably been the biggest surprise and I think I've been luckier than uh the other cast members because I get to wear prosthetics so everyone I've met who um recognizes me as Elnor has been like you know oh it's like looking at you, I can see it. But if I walk by you in the street, I wouldn't have noticed you. So I get yeah. <laughs> that little bit of anonymity, which I'm kind of happy with. Is, is it kind of that sort of thing where they sort of see you? They kind of sense that oh, I I know you from somewhere, but I can't quite place where. Sort of sort of reaction. Yeah, normally it is. It's it's they'll walk past, they'll stop, they'll kind of look, do a double take. Um, I mean, Patrick has it probably uh, the worst. We were <laughs> um, when we went and did the. Uh, the European press tour, we were fortunate enough to go visit the Leaning Tower of Pisa and just the amount of people who would stop and Patrick would be to my right, they'd be on my left, they'd be looking the complete different direction, staring at him yeah. and then they'd just slowly turn the camera <laughs> as if they're taking like a 360-degree yeah. photo of the entire area. Everyone knows. Yeah. Um, so I, I've been like very lucky and hopefully – I don't get noticed as much because, you know, it's it's been nice being able to just like walk around and, and not get stopped by as many people. But the people who do, who have stopped me, like to be fair, have been like really lovely. And, you know, like, like all Star Trek fans, actually, they're all just, you know, nice people who love the show. Absolutely. Um, so now here's, here's a bit of a local question for you. You're the first ever Aussie actor to be cast in a principal role in a Star Trek series. How does that feel? Massive. Uh, I didn't know that until someone said, I think it was like, because Chris Hemsworth, I, I think there's been like three other um, Aussies who have been on the show, but yeah, none of them have been reoccurring. None of them have um, have been able to keep their accent as well. Mm. So it's, it's pretty big, but I, I think it's good, you know, like people, kids from Australia and hopefully, you know, p- kids who can't really identify with anyone, you know, because Australia is like known for having like a large multicultural population. It's just good. I'm just happy that I get to be, you know, one of those kids who gets to go up there and show some representation. Absolutely. Speaking of the accent, at what point during pre-production or production was it decided that you could actually keep your Aussie accent for the character of Elnor? So during the audition process and uh, everything, I I spoke with an American accent with your stock standard thing that was part of the audition. And I think it was one week before I was due to start uh, filming. So we'd done a table read. We'd, we'd been doing rehearsals and I've been doing all my stunt fight training and, and going over things. And I, it was Jonathan Frakes okay. um, who called me in. We sat down, we spoke, and then he said to me, he's like, you know, it's, it's always a, a tradition, you know, people who come onto Trek don't necessarily have to put on like an American accent or anything like that. Trek is very inclusive. And he spoke to the showrunners and the executive producers and then he asked me, you know, would you like to keep your Australian accent, you know, add a bit of diversity and difference into Trek? And I, and I, you know, jumped at the opportunity. I was like, hell yeah, you know. <laughs> it, it was my first acting gig and anything to make it kind of like the transition and everything easier for me, I, you know, jumped at because the easier it is for me, the better a performance I can give. So I, I was very happy with doing that, yeah. And I guess also... Considering all the other Romulans on the show, um, with Harry Treadaway and also uh, Peyton List uh, playing Nerissa and uh, Narek, I mean, they both had British accents. So it had all kind of almost been semi established that the Romulans uh, on the show were either kind of British accents or kind of, you know, colonial <laughs> accents in, in the case of uh, you know, yourself being able to do the Aussie accent sort of thing. So, yeah. so I guess from that perspective, it's sort of, you know, vaguely in keeping with um, the uh, established Romulan style for, for Picard. Not to mention the Romulan Empire is pretty much spread out everywhere. So it would kind of make sense if a young boy of, you know, like six or seven if he's been moved to a different area where people speak different dialects or people, you know, it, it's just kind of like a melting pot of, you know, different accents and languages and dialects, you know, you're going to pick up on those things and your accent is going to slightly alter. So I think it kind of makes sense 
him having grown up on this planet full of you know refugees and everything that he speaks different to most Romulans. I mean, we've got an Irish Romulan now too. In my oh, of course, my that's right. With, that's right with Zaban and Laris. Zaban La- and Laris, Laris. Yeah. yes, yes. And Laris is so cool, you know. So I, I think they were <laughs> they were happy to include include my accent into it, and I'm very grateful, you know. Yeah, so. I think the first time um, I saw your character introduced in um, Absolute Candor, it's like, oh, he he's doing his Aussie accent, like, <laughs> yeah. Because I'd read that you were Australian, but I just kind of automatically assumed, oh yeah, he'll be putting on a. Um, an American accent or kind of maybe a, uh, a sort of a more neutral British sort of accent perhaps. But no, I thought, oh, this is fantastic because yeah, yeah. I think um, we've never really, yeah, as we've never really had an Aussie accent in a Star Trek series before. So, you know, that's, you know, props to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm the first. I'm, I'm number one. No, no one can take that from me. No, no one can. With. What was it like the first time uh, you got to meet Patrick Stewart and what was he like to work with? <laughs> Um, so the first time meeting Patrick Stewart, I, I think I've, I embarrassed the hell out of myself. Um, I rocked up to set for stunt fight training and I had just gotten off the plane as well. So I was pretty jet lagged, pretty tired, but, um, you know, keen to start my first day of work and meet everyone. And Patrick was actually shooting the interview scene from episode one. Mm -hmm. So I came in, watched, um, watched a few takes and then it was his break and then they brought him over to 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 meet uh so i think the first thing he said was hi my name is patrick and i said good thanks <laughs> that's like I that's classic <laughs> mm, i can't get over like how embarrassed i was as soon as i as soon as i shook his ha- head uh hand and like looked at like looked at him in the eye i was like i've screwed this <laughs> meeting up like because oh, fr- no. like, you can only give one one first impression, <laughs> yes. but he was pretty cool with it. And then um, I think I think it was a week and a half later we started a my first I started my first day on set, and he could see I was nervous as well, like terrified. And you know he kind of came over over to me, spoke to me for I think it would have been maybe like five or six minutes, but it was the most comforting and reassuring five or six minutes I've ever had on set. He. Mm-hmm was just like so reassuring not even in a way where it was he was pointing out that I was nervous I think he just he told me a story I think about like how he used to get nervous like when he do plays and stuff and mm. then and how he can still get nervous so I think it once I realized that Sir Patrick Stewart um even is a bit unsure of himself <laughs> at times like it, it put me at ease it's like okay I'm going to be experiencing this um you know hopefully for the rest of my career and you know it'll just be the norm it's not going to be something that gets in the way it will just be part of the process yeah fantastic that's a great story um so what was your what was your favorite scene or moment for elnor in season one (sighs) did you have a is there a moment or a scene that just sticks in your mind there are a few for for different reasons um the at the moment it's the last episode my my scene with michelle heard raffi um, has to be one of my favorite uh, scenes. Another scene was when this is more for off off scene reasons for um, like outtakes and stuff. But I was shoot when Jerry Nine becomes the Borg Queen. Mm-hmm. So there was a moment we had to film, and it took us forever because Jer- and it was a very serious moment in the scene, like in in the show and in the scene. And we just kept cracking up laughing. We <laughs> we couldn't stop. Every time we made eye contact with one another, yep. we broke. We just broke character. <laughs> And, and eventually, what, like, what, all... what was it that was setting you off? Do you think? No, boy, it ended up getting cut from. Um, it ended up getting cut from the the show. I had a line where I say one one impossible thing at a time to her, mm-hmm. and every time I used to step up and I just, I'd like leave the scene, step into it, and then say the line, and she'd just laugh. <laughs> and then when we had to do the reverse shot. And I had to say it, I'd laugh, so right. I'd ruin the take, and she'd ruin my take, and it, it just kept. So like, it was it, it was just one of those crazy things that you're just laughing for kind of no specific reason, but they've just yeah, so you've just got the giggles sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, it was like the end of the day. You know, we'd gone through everything, and I think it was just you know something to do with a bit of tiredness and it being the last shot. Mm-hmm. We were just you know, uh, and also my favorite scene would probably have to be my would have to be. The scene before that, you know, when the the queen cell doors go up, and I say, "Please, my friends, choose to live." That's. I think I think you have to go down for this season having the most 
most classic and quotable line. I think I think that line that you you've you obviously is kind of Elnor's catchphrase. Yeah, uh, is just going to stick in. Like, there's going to be t-shirts with that on it for sure. You know. Well, there's already coffee mugs. Oh, um, right. I try. I actually tried buying one, and they're sold out. All oh, right. Yeah. So <laughs> I've I've had to ask CBS to let me know when um when they're back in stock okay <laughs> for my yeah but it, i have to honestly like thank michael shaven for um creating that badass line because that's anytime anyone's ever messaged me or people who have noticed me have just been like that line is probably one of the best in trek history i love the moment in um i think it was episode 10 are they, are they episode 9 episode 10 where you come into the last arena uh, and you've got your sword at uh, at Narek's throat, and you say in Romulan the line, and he goes, "Oh, oh, uh, I choose life, I choose life." Uh, I very much choose to live. Yeah, yeah. It was, well, I, that, that was improved um, by Harry on the day by Harry Treadaway. Oh, wow. the, I very much do choose to live. So, I, and you know what, it adds to the scene so much. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, I like. Yeah, that shooting that scene was actually very fun. Yeah. We shot the fire scene afterwards as well, mm-hmm. so it was a good day. It was a nice day. Santiago ate a lot of apples. Oh wow! That day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Apples. <laughs> well, there's this scene where we're um, from ep- oh, episode of course. ten, I think, yes, where yes. we're so we filmed. That was all um, the one day of shooting. So yeah, I just remember him going through apple after apple after apple. He might have needed a few bathroom breaks, perhaps during that yeah. day. <laughs> no, I think I think he did. Yeah. yeah. Um, so sp- speaking before of uh, of, of uh, you and Jerry Ryan or whatever, you obviously had a, a few scenes with her. What was she like to work with? She's just the best. I mean, like a lot of our scenes are just her and I. So it would be, you know, her and I on set and we'd be, you know, just sitting around talking. She's full of advice as well. Like not just in, in terms of navigating the world of Trek, but, you know, she's a very experienced actress and um, she she was just like nothing but helpful and she's really funny. I think that's um, something that does it like gets past people a lot that people don't know know about her. She's one of the funniest people I've ever met, and she's just like a darling to work with. Wow! Had you, and were you previously coming into the show? Were you kind of as much of a Voyager fan as you were Next Generation? Or my my mum my mum is so I mm-hmm. called her up and I was like, guess like because it was I read at the end of um at the end of episode four, like reading the script. And I'm like, wait, hang on, seven of nine, seven of nine. And then I rang my mom up. I'm like, oh, guess who I'm going to be working with? And she's like, oh, who, who, who? She started naming like LeVar, Marina. And then yeah. I'm like, nah, I think other Trek. And then she was like, obviously like, oh, Worf? Like, is Worf coming back? And I'm like, no, seven, seven of nine. She's just like, oh my God, you know, so. I think, yeah. I, I think yeah, when the, um, when that first trailer dropped and there was that scene uh, with her in the, um, the uh, Chateau Picard kind of office set where she says to Picard, you know, I, what are you doing here, Picard, saving the galaxy? I think just fans probably went mental, I think. <laughs> the cheer, Yeah, the cheering was yes. just as loud, I think, when Patrick entered because all of us came on and then Patrick came on last, mm-hmm. you know, yep. as, as it should be. But the cheer for him coming on was as big as the cheer for her appearing on screen. Oh, I can't get over San Diego Comic-Con. It was just otherworldly. Yeah, I bet it was. Yeah. yeah. Hey, speaking of Comic Con, have you uh, have you seen anybody like in Elnor cosplay or anything yet? Not yet. I was kind of hoping. Um, I, I met a few people at Chicago Comic Con before um, you know all the Corona stuff happened, so that we I managed to do one con appearance, and a few of them were like uh, were telling me they're already planning on their Elnor outfits for Star Trek Las Vegas. So if if that ends up going uh, going ahead, I can't wait to see all the uh, Elnor cosplay. They might do it better than me. I'm kind of <laughs> I'm kind of scared. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm sure. Surely not. Surely not. So during the course of, of season one, I I felt a real uh, bond develop between uh, Seven and Elnor, um, with her kind of taking him under her wing, perhaps as a kind of replacement for her losing Icheb. Um, Icheb, yeah. Yeah. Do you um, know if this relationship is going to even develop further in the second season? Well, I've heard, like, the funny thing is everyone, all these Trekkies online have been sending me articles saying that there's rumours of, like, a spin-off and, uh, uh, <laughs> like, of, of Seven and myself and they, they keep asking me, like, oh, is it going to happen? Have you heard anything? Because uh, I think Michael Shaben during a Q&A, apparently he jokingly half-pitched it, but people have just kind of, like, ran with it. They've run, <laughs> yes, that is, yeah. um, 
and they've asked me like my opinion on it. Would I love to see a spin off? Uh, I mean, like, yeah, any. Any more Trek's good Trek, in my opinion. I don't even care if the spin-off doesn't include me. I'd just watch it, you know. Um, but bit, I bit, bit too soon to be talking spin-offs. Let's let's get season yeah, exa- season exactly. two and even season three, kind of you know, un- exactly. under our belt before you start worrying about that. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, like season one just ended, and I'm like, wow, you're already like, you know, we're, I'm, I'm more excited to see what season two has in hold, and I, I'd love to continue on the relationship with our. Uh, with seven of nine and and myself because I think we've got a good dynamic. I, I see, like you know, Elnor gravitates towards strong female figures because he grew up with a bunch of them. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's the 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 type of people he relates to. You know, people who are strong willed and and you know, seven of nine is not afraid to give her opinion. You know, that's kind of like pretty similar to you know, absolute candor. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'd love to see a kind of. Uh, almost like a Batman and Robin dynamic duo sort of thing happen there. I'd love it. If it gets explored, yeah, if it gets explored in further seasons, you know, I'm all for it. Absolutely. Um, Cause there was, there was several um, real tender moments uh, I, I sort of found between Elnor that he shares with not only, um, you know, Seven and Picard, but also as you mentioned before with, with Raffi as well uh, in season one. And it, it, it kind of seems like Elnor, is a really diverse character in the sense that he can, one minute he can go from like a sword wielding badass to kind of having this sort of childlike innocence and this sort of emotional sensitivity, you know, uh, tell me, tell me a little bit about that sort of diversity of, of the, of character and, and you're working with that. I mean, it was, to be honest, to begin with, it was a bit hard because everything we know about Romulans is so different. It's like, oh, secretive and, you know, un, you know, untrustworthy and they, they keep everything kind of to themselves. They reveal only things as they need to be revealed. They're viewed as, you know, the enemy. Um, so when I got the script, I kind of was thinking, like when I started reading, is there something else like hidden about this character? Is he actually this kind of open um, with everything? And it turns out, yeah. So I kind of had to throw everything I knew about Romulan culture out the door and just kind of find like ways to bond and find connections with the character. And it was kind of easy. I grew up with in a household full of women. He grew up in a household full of women. But like I had to go back to other Trek when it came to viewing, because every Trek has an iteration of a character, you know, who was, who's seeing the world through kind of like a, a fresh lens and like an understanding of the world. So I had to go back to previous Treks to kind of see how each character, each version of that character in that series went about things. Okay. But it's, Is there anything particular you drew, drew upon in that context? Like I had to play it straight, to be mm. honest, even in the comedic moments because mm. he, I just viewed it as like if, if he's playing for humour, that means that he underst- like has an understanding of the things he's talking about, whereas he just has a fresh take on, on things and he's happy to give those opinion on things. So that's what I kind of had to keep reminding myself like he 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 views himself as serious even if people view him as like an idiot if that makes sense well an idiot i guess a wrong word naive is probably the best the best word there's a lot of naivety surrounding the character but i mean he's still a badass with a sword and you got to kind of like watch out Mm -hmm. yes absolutely so speaking of um of comedic moments that there I think there are sort of immense opportunities um, for humour in the character of Elnor, you know, particularly stemming from uh, the way of absolute candour, uh, which, yeah. which kind of we got a glimmer of in, in, in season one. Would you like to explore more kind of comedic uh, aspects of the character in the second season? Oh, most definitely. Um, I think the the lines that he's been given, even in the like lighthearted moments, are still very memorable. I think that's one of the things that draws people to my character is his innocence, but also, you know, his deadliness. Absolutely. Now, tell us a little bit about um, the martial arts or sort of sword training that you did in the lead up to the production of season one. And did you did your prior experience with, with boxing where I heard you had, had previously won like a state boxing champion? Did that kind of help with the martial arts and sword stuff? So it, oh, I mean, to to a degree, it helped with uh, it really helped with the with the fight sequences. Like all of the the only thing is is doing a, a stunt and like do, have like doing an actual fight is you've got to exaggerate everything. You're like two meters apart. It's all camera, you know, kind of trickery and everything. But the sword fighting, I had no experience with, and it was the first day I landed in LA. We pretty much got started straight away, and we. 
were learning sequences um, that would were either being cut or were going to be shot, you know, three months in advance to make it look as good and realistic as possible. So it was just about it was just about getting the rep, the repetition right and and all the poses and stuff to make it look as legitimate as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and the stunt team, you know, they asked me, "What are you willing to do? What are you comfortable with doing?" what would you like to, to give a go, like have a go at? And I wanted to do as much as I could because it's all, you know, a learning experience. And the more I can do it myself, the better it'd look on camera. I'm, I'm guessing though, maybe you didn't do the, the shots where you were sort of spinning uh, sideways through the air. <laughs> no, that, 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 I left that to the, um, stunt, to the experts. Stunt team, my, yep. Yeah. My, um, my stunt train, the guy who trained me with the sword was actually my stunt double. Oh, okay. And, um, Funnily enough, he's also the person who kills uh, Daj in um, episode oh, one. Oh, okay, the the, the Romulan. Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Romulan. Yeah, mm-hmm. so the Romulan that um that that kills Daj is, is actually the one, the uh, one, my the stunt one, double. The one that takes the sci- the the, uh, the the tablet to to disintegrate or whatever, or that. Th- he's he yeah he's the one who disintegrates. Right, gotcha. Yep. With okay. the who causes the the explosion? explosion. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it was kind of funny seeing him. I'm like, oh, there's an ace, and it's, <laughs> yeah. but it's it's cool watching him do all the stunts as well. Watching Elnor do all these cool, you know, flips and like running along walls, because I'm just sat there normally just watching him do it in real life. But it's just cool watching it blend from him to to myself. And people think it's the one character still. You know, it's not like, oh. His face looks different, you know. That they, they got a close up of the stunt double's face, or it looks fake. So mm-hmm. it's it's really good, and it's a credit to him and and the whole stunt team for making Elnor look, you know, like a ninja. Elnor is completely unique. He, he I can't, I, you know, we haven't seen a, a character like him. I think he's almost like the he's like the Star Trek version of a Jedi, kind of almost, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, Space Legolas is um yes what everyone's been um been calling me lately. So it's pretty <laughs> yes. good, and I found out like um if you. If you Google, if you look up what Elnor means in Elvish, what the the language from Lord of the Rings, yes. um, you, it means Star Trek. Oh, seriously? Yeah, it translates directly <laughs> to Star Trek. I didn't find wow. that out until after the season had finished either. That, so, that, is, um, that is a great little piece of trivia. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I really like that. Um, it just shows the detail they go into these shows, you know, mm. the, the backstory and the background and the build-up of all these characters. It shows that they care and that, you know, they're big fans of Trek. So tell us a bit about, obviously you had, um, you know, a bit of makeup to kind of contend with. You had the wig and the ears and all that sort of stuff. Tell me about the uh, process getting into makeup and and whether that kind of helped you in some way get into character as well. I mean, it definitely does. I was working with Richard Redlifson and um, James McKinnon. So James McKinnon oversees, I'm pretty sure, all the prosthetic design, makeup and everything across all the Treks. Um... So the process for the ears, blocking out the eyebrows, and my hair was a lot shorter, so um, they put me in this big wig, uh, which obviously looks really cool when it's all done up and it's got the top knot and everything. But Mm -hmm. it was about an hour and 40 minutes. It sounds like a lot of time, but I had just shot a movie where I was, I think, three and a half hours to four hours in prosthetic makeup. So when I found out I was doing prosthetics for a Star Trek, I asked them, you know, how long it would be. Um, and as soon as they told me an hour and 40 minutes, I was like, yeah, that's a walk in the park. I can do yeah. that. No problem. So I just sleep in the chair yep. most of the time. My call time is like four in the morning. So I, hair and makeup's about an hour and 40 minutes. So I'm just asleep in my chair yeah. for as much I, as, I, as I can be. I definitely feel for actors like, um, say, Armin Shimmerman, who played Quark on DS9. Uh, I think he was in makeup for every day for like four hours or something to, to, yeah. get, to get that. I, I really... I really well, feel even, for actors even who have Doug, to go through that. Doug Jones in, in Discovery and, and he does I mean like he's the prosthetic king, I think. Like I he's in Pan's Labyrinth and everything. So he's always in like these elaborate you know, kind of costumes and makeup and prosthetics. So I can't imagine you know, uh, my heart goes out out to out to him and everyone who does like full body prosthetics. I feel I feel your pain. Yeah, yes. <laughs> the very first episode you uh, you featured in, which was episode four, Absolute Candor. Jonathan Frakes directed that episode. Tell me, what was it like working with Jonathan as a director? Hands down, the best director I've ever worked with. I think because he understands and knows Trek, it's been like such a big part of his life. 
and you know he shoots Discovery and the Orville, and and uh, so I think he he well, he goes in knowing exactly what he needs, exactly what he wants, and he's able to get the performance out of the actors because he you know he's so prepared and just careful with it. And he, every time we were working with him, you could tell he was taking into consideration what the fans were expecting from it too, and I think he delivered really really well i couldn't have chosen a better director for my first episode than uh jonathan frakes as you say the guy knows trek back to front you know he's a, a fantastic director and i i always wonder um whether for example the episodes that he appeared in as as Riker, working with you know working with other directors i always think hey, i wonder wh- whether he's thinking you know is this directed the other director were doing it right is he you know happy with the way he's being directed as a um as an as an actor when he has to do that sort of thing as well you know because obviously he wore he wore multiple hats in this season as both actor and director yeah and did a great job with uh yeah. with oh. both of them like uh oh, both him and marina as well in in that episode i thought did a fantastic job you know uh i think there's probably a few fans that were sort of um thinking oh you know it's been so long since we've seen them on screen are they going to be um the characters you know, we remember, or are they going to be a bit rusty? But I thought they both did a, you know, an absolutely superb job. And it was just like they'd just back, like riding a bike they'd ridden many times before, yeah. you know. Everyone's kind of biggest thought or like worry was what's Picard going to be like after all this time with uh, TNG, after TNG. So there was always this expectation of, or this kind of question, what's the show going to be like? What are the characters going to be like? What's the story going to be like? So I think. We've all kind of faced those questions, and I think, yeah, Nepenthe, all those episodes, and especially episode ten with Riker. I think we, yeah, we delivered. I was very, very happy with um with how the show ended. Did you hear during the course of the season, sort of any of the internet chatter that was kind of going on, and the kind of fan uh, speculation about? storylines and all that sort of stuff people were, everything's people were kind of um uh assuming was coming I heard, up I heard, michael dawn came to set once and so did lavar yes but, um everyone and i think they signed michael uh, signed they, the uh the, the slate yeah yeah the, the michael clapable. signed the slate yeah and everyone lost their mind being like he's on the show and i <laughs> yes. and my sister called me asked me if wolf's coming on and i was like no <laughs> he's not gonna appear <laughs> i mean not season one anyway. I mean, hopefully, mm. I, I'd like to see every TNG character make an appearance at some I think, point. I think I saw an interview really, with Alex, Alex Kurtzman saying that he he would like for each one to make an appearance at some point throughout the course of the show, which would be obviously fantastic to see. I want uh, Q. I want Q oh, personally. I'd love well, there, to. There, there was I'd a, love there an was episode a, like that. Absolutely, there was a, there was a huge rumor going around that actually Q was going to be in season one because there was like a um, a behind the scenes photo leaked uh, on a blue screen where where this somebody was wearing like a red glove sitting in a chair did you happen to see that yeah yeah i know exactly what that yeah yeah do, i remember you, i remember you know, that coming do, up do you know what that was that that read because obviously that wasn't q but everyone was like oh it's q q's gonna be in it you know but I'm obviously pre- it was i'm pretty sure that was an outfit design that got changed oh right i'm fairly certain that was just a te- like a, a test for i'm not going to mention which character because they'll probably release you know, photos and stuff. And I don't actually know what I'm allowed to talk about, like what's been included and what's been taken out of the show. But I believe, I'm pretty sure, um, cause if I remember, if I remember seeing the, the, the picture, yeah, that was, a, I, know, I know which character it was for too, but yeah, okay. I'd love to, I'd love to see Q. He's my favorite. He's my favorite character. And I think particularly the rapport between Q and Picard, uh, has always been this, um, this just, you know, fantastic dynamic with them kind of bouncing off each other, you know. And I think that's kind of one of those classic uh, moments of Trek that I think everybody just wants to see again, you know. Yeah, well, I'd like to see Picard. Like, I'm, imagine them, you know, encountering each other now. Mm. It's like, that would make for some good television. I should, re- yeah, we should start a petition or something. Get yes. you on. And I think <laughs> even though obviously John Delancey has, you know, aged a few years like the rest of the cast or whatever i think it would be very easy to um you could just argue that he's aged yeah he's 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 appeared like this to to make it you know patrick feel or picard sorry feel more mm -hmm. at ease Mm, exactly there's there's heaps of ways behind that like oh yeah you can fix that he could initially appear as we saw him last and then, you know, click his fingers and go, oh, I like." he could make some crack to uh, Picard like, uh, oh, I like this new, this older season look of yours. I can do that too, you know. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. yeah. 
looking back at sort of the whole of the uh, first season, what would you kind of say was your biggest acting challenge? I'd have to put it down to first day jitters. One of the, like one of the hardest things for me uh, was you know just being in a room full of people working on Star Trek, my second ever acting job across from Sir Patrick Stewart. I'd have to say that was the biggest challenge. But um, as the season progressed, you know, I got more comfortable and everything. But we did this scene. It ended up getting cut, but it was a stunt where I'd have to jump. This warehouse, it was in a warehouse studio. And I think it was about two and a half stories high, but I had to jump from the top. Full. I had like supported robes, but the only thing that would do would, bre- would break my fall so I wouldn't land with all my weight onto my feet, you know, because you're jumping from such a high high place. But having, having to just trust in people who are holding you by a rope and letting you fall as fast as you can, that would, I'd have to say that was the biggest challenge okay. I, I had to deal with. And, and that scene with Rafi where I have to break down, that was very mm-hmm. hard just okay. to kind of like turn that on almost instantly because it's a, you know, it's, it just looks instantaneous, but you know, that's like a, it's like a 12 hour day mm, mm. of having, of, of you're doing multiple scenes and you know, you're feeling a different, you know, your character's in a different headspace in each, in each of these scenes. You're not shooting it in order. Was so that you have to scene go. shot on location? Or it was shot on like, no, it was shot on location in Malibu. Okay. So we were actually meant to shoot that three days prior as well. Um, but there were these bushfires in Malibu. So the, like, a, like a bunch of fire um, kind of like ravaged the area. So we had to cancel shooting. So also having to like get yourself into that state and then having to hold on to it for three more days was also very difficult. You know, because, you know, it's, it's all a process and mm. you draw from inspiration. And I, I knew it was a big scene. So I just spent that time, you know, like reading, you know, reading sad books, watching sad movies, yeah, uh, yeah. poetry, thinking about, you know, sad stuff that's happened in my life. And I'm like, okay, I've got, I've got it all there. It's very accessible. And then rocked up to set, filmed a bunch of other scenes and then this fire happened and then they're like, oh, we're not going to film that last bit today. And it's like, oh, what am I going to do? So I had to hold it in for, yeah, a good three more days before being able to release it. But what a release. Felt yeah. so good after that. And did you and did you feel with that scene, Elnor um, had necessarily spent all that much screen time with Rafi. Do you, do you feel that um, that moment was... Uh, uh, as you know, as powerful shared with Rafi as it would have been with Seven, because there was a real bond um, forming between him and Seven. There was that sort of mother um, son almost relationship forming. Do you do you feel um, that Ono oh that that moment definitely uh, was you know to be played out with Rafi, or do you sort of feel like oh it would have been good to have that moment with Seven in that scene? I think if it had happened with Seven, the dynamic of it would have been a little bit different. Um... I, I I think it worked a lot with Rafi because Elnor's an orphan, doesn't really ha- like has just lost a, a parental figure, and then here's a here's a woman who had just a, f- a few episodes earlier just been rejected by her you know her only son. Um, so I think they both found something that they were looking that they were looking for in that kind of moment. Mm-hmm. So. She, I think she, I think Rafi kind of saw, you know, the, a way to comfort the son that she, you know, a way to comfort someone as a son Absolutely. or as a mother that she had previously hadn't been able to do. And I think Elnor could find a little bit more comfort with Rafi because he he has a higher attachment to Seven and to Seven and to Picard, but you know, he's just lost someone he's really like who, who he's had such a large attachment to. So I think it comes across better. Mm. with Rafi. I think it plays out better. And I think and I wouldn't want to take away from the moment with Rios and Seven of Nine either. Mm. I really enjoyed yeah, watching that, that great, moment that between them. That was a them. great scene too, yeah. Yeah, so I figure you know if I had to do the scene with Seven, we we would lose that really mm. great moment between mm. um between Rios and Seven. So no, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. What Star Trek character either from Picard or from another past Star Trek series, would you love Elnor to share the screen with in future episodes? I wouldn't mind like a little bit of a ego contest, like match up with Worf. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Ab- like even if it's Absolutely. just talk, even if it's just a little like talk from across the room kind of moment, you know, like I'd, I'd, I'd really, I'd really like that, like a moment like that. Or also, I'd, I don't know why, but, 
I just always have this idea of um, Soji and Elnor getting into a fight with a bunch of people and Elnor takes out like five people. Yeah. And then looks around and Soji's yeah. taking out like 20 of them. <laughs> yeah, yes. And it's just waiting for me to finish, yeah, yeah. you yes, know, kind yeah, of yeah. just to put like, uh, even though even though he's, you know, like really deadly with a weapon and everything, you still can't match yeah, synth, yeah. you know. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that'd be that'd be a fun fun thing. I think it would be, a, a, as you just said earlier, a fantastic moment. You know, Worf with a Batleth giving some fight tips to Elnor, you know, with his yeah. sword or something. That, that, would be a, that would be a great scene to see, wouldn't it? Yeah, like a nice, a nice little like sparring contest yeah. where he's instructing me, you know what yes, I mean? Like yeah. just something <laughs> like that or even puts me in my place. Like I get a bit too arrogant and he's able to, you know, yeah, I think I think that'd be like a really good moment. Hopefully, the hopefully um, I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll shoot Michael Shaben a text message <laughs> yes. and be like, "Hey, I've got an idea." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Um, so tell me, um, do you have an action figure yet? And have you seen with it? Are there any action figures that have come out for the show? Um, someone in I believe Scotland has made some pretty cool eighties retro looking oh, right. uh, Star Trek Picard custom action figures. But right. I know the show. I know for a fact the show are getting them made because I had to pose for a bunch of them. Okay, like I had to do different different you know movements. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I. But as soon as they come out, they're all going to be sold out anyway. Because I'm going to you're going to buy them all up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, of course. You got to buy all. The, you got to have your own action characters. figure, don't you? Yeah, I'm going to buy all the characters, and then probably just recreate scenes throughout the show. Have you heard anything from the studio or um, from the producers regarding the whether you know there's going to be a delay in season two getting underway in the light of the coronavirus and so forth? So from what I have heard so far, the coronavirus isn't um affecting what's happening with season two uh i kind of from what i've heard so far but you you can't really tell i mean i'm I'm just taking this day by day Mm -hmm. um but as far as i'm concerned i know when we're scheduled to shoot and that there's and i I can't say obviously but that's going ahead as planned so far oh well that's that's the the fact that you've you've got a, a schedule and a date set ahead to uh to shoot that's that's in itself is positive news. It's an extensive cast and crew, you know, mm. like there's a lot of people. It's a big set and it's a big production. But um, I don't know. If it, if it does get delayed, I can't imagine it being like very long because it is it is such a big show and they're, like we do have a schedule we need to keep. So, I mean, I, I guess there'd be a bit of wiggle room and I'm ex- I am expecting a bit of delay, but I haven't heard anything. So, okay. You know, fingers crossed there is no delay because I'm so excited to film season two. Um, I just cannot wait. Absolutely. I think like us all. Um, I, I heard that um, – you might correct me if I'm wrong here. The the show is kind of slated to run for three seasons or something. Is that is that kind of the plan or – Well, uh, from what I've heard, Patrick said early on – I think he said it in like his first interview about Picard. He – He'd only like the show to go for about three seasons, um, and I believe when we've spoken about about the series, it's I think we're just taking it season by season, seeing how the fans are, are receiving the show. I mean, like you can't really get too far ahead. If we were talking about you know three or five seasons before season one had aired, and I mean, thank God it's an amazing thing, like an amazing show, like no surprises. But if it had gone the complete opposite direction and had been a terrible show we wouldn't be talking about the second season or the, or even the third. So I'm I mean, just happy to be shooting two. Like, I'm just happy we've been confirmed for a second. Oh, yeah. And look, I think obviously the studio has a lot of uh, uh, confidence in the show because they, they had announced that uh, season two was greenlit before even one episode of season one had gone to air. So Yeah. Uh, that... Well, we weren't and, – and they told us as well, they're like, we've announced it, but well, you can't talk about it. So yeah. every time someone asked us about it – like, we can say, I can say it now, but every time someone asked about it, I, I, I had to feign ignorance. Mm, right. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I heard, but I haven't been told anything okay. yet. I'm not sure whether you're able to – talk about how many seasons you've sort of signed on for or anything like that are you able to mention anything like that oh wait no yeah i'm a series regular i've, I've been set on a series yeah i'll be back for season two okay right fan. Okay. there we go okay yeah. <laughs> that's good news is there any particular direction you'd like to see elnor go in for season two to be honest i'd like shorter hair um <laughs> but that's about it i think it's gonna stay i do like his hairstyle but uh the direction i, I don't know i'd like to see maybe a not a complete move, but a little bit of a shift um, from 
him being, you know, such a staunch co-op malat. I mean, he's learning how to lie. He's learning about people being, being distrustful. Um, I also think he's learning that lying also necessarily doesn't isn't a bad thing. Um, so I'd kind of like to see that that development. And also, you know, he's seen a lot of death. And it hasn't a hundred, like, but it's all happened so quickly. So I'd just like to see the effect that it's taking on him. Um, witnessing the death of people he seems to care about and the people who are very close to him. I mean, first his parents, then Picard left and abandoned him. Then Hugh and then Picard again, even though Picard's alive now. So it's just kind of like, how does it, how does like a 17 year old boy deal with that? Mm, mm. I'd, I'd, li- I'd like to see, I'd like to delve into that a bit more and, you know, him kind of, having to leave the 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 co-op my lap behind you know he's had to go off on this adventure to kind of discover himself and it's like where does that conflict with what with his beliefs so that that's kind of what I'd like to delve into there were some really great moments in the first season where you could kind of see like this kid it's his first time in space um, he has sort of never left the planet before and particularly there's, there's little moments for example when they arrived at free cloud and everybody is getting their custom custom advertisement come up on the screen where you know Picard's getting uh, invita- invitations to to high tea and Rios is getting uh, ship engineering ads and Girardi's getting robotic ads and Elnor doesn't get any ads at all yeah. because he's because he's a clean slate he's never been off off world and he goes oh where, 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 where's my ad <laughs> you know yeah I, I love that scene. It's, <laughs> it's it's a nice touch of humor yeah. very very nice touch of humor. I think there's another good scene in absolute um, candor when um, the autopilot comes on, uh, Rios is a uh, Spanish-speaking autopilot, mm-hmm. and Elnor, there's a really good shot, a, like insert of me looking at between um, Rios and the pilot, just absolutely confused as to what's going on. Like, why is there two of them? Did that, so did that, a, that scene get cut from the episode? No, it's in, but it's like a, literally a flash of a second. Oh, right. <laughs> um but it's just like one of my favorite, like that, even that was fun to film, like mm. watching Santiago play one character and then us having to go in and then him play the other. Yep, yep. Yeah, he's a fantastic, very, How you know, I, very good actor. Fantastic actor. Yeah, the, the diversity with all of his different holograms that he played was, you know, very entertaining. I know. One of my favorite scenes with mm. uh, him and Michelle yep. and all the different, oh, yeah, yes, really yes. good. Um, actually, speaking of deleted scenes, were there any... Um, uh, any cool scenes that uh, you shot but were it ended up being deleted from uh, from the episodes that you can think of? I don't think it's the uh, – there's no real – I mean, in the earlier drafts, there's like a lot of scenes that get cut out for other because they don't make too much sense – well, not make too much sense to the story, but if you take them out, they don't impede on the story. Um, a lot of the scenes – don't really get cut but i guess the length of them are shortened so mm-hmm. either some dialogue gets changed or added in or you know it, it just depends but no i'm pretty happy yeah a lot a lot of my favorite scenes and stuff um were kept in there you go well thank you so much evan for uh for chatting with me today it's been it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the channel no thank you for having me um my parents will probably be watching this so uh, hi mom and dad <laughs> <laughs> that, that just it blows my mind that your your parents have been uh have been watching uh, my reviews and everything on youtube uh, after every episode that no they've, that's they've been wild. following it yeah since since you started doing them very staunch um <laughs> for, uh, fans yeah oh, that's 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 that, that just that just blows my mind <laughs> Well, thank thank you so much. Uh, we obviously can't wait to see uh, season two. Hopefully, we don't have to wait uh, wait too long for it. Um, and then that will. I know. Be- fingers crossed. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for for joining me on the show today. No, thanks for having me, Nick. Well, what a massive privilege and a pleasure it was to chat with Evan today on the show. Uh, some really great anecdotes there from him uh, from the first season of the uh, of the series and also a few little uh, cool hints about what sort of things we might end up seeing in season two. I hope you guys enjoyed watching that as much as I enjoyed uh, having the interview with Evan. No doubt we'll have uh, Star Trek Discovery Season 3 coming up very soon and I'll be doing some other reviews on some other sci-fi TV shows that are on air at the moment. I might even try my luck and see if I can uh, organise another interview with one of the other 
Star Trek Picard cast members. We'll see how we go with that one. Please, as always, please subscribe to the channel, guys. Please like, comment, uh, and share this video. And I will see you again very soon for my next review.